In this video, I will look at how constructivist psychology can help us teach children more effectively. And I will focus on the ideas of George Kelly and Lev Vygotsky. First, George Kelly. George Kelly was an American psychologist who developed personal construct psychology, which focuses on how our construction of reality develops and grows over time, and how we interact with new information and experiences. For Kelly, it is the way we perceive situations that guides both our cognition and our behavior, not the actual situations. Let's look at a few ideas. At the beginning of your lesson, what are the children focused on? They could, of course, be focused on anything. Perhaps one child might be focused on chatting with a friend. Another might be thinking about what he's going to do after class. Another might be focused on what she's going to learn today. To Kelly, all of us are living in our own unique realities, and each of our minds is moving in a unique direction that makes sense to us. And what we focus on at any moment is a choice. We are continually making choices about what to focus on and which direction to move in, even though we may often not be aware that we are making choices. If we start from this idea, what is the first thing we need to do in a lesson? I think it means we need to start with an attractive or intriguing activity that draws the children into the lesson so that they choose to stop focusing on whatever they were focused on and choose to focus on our lesson. And what is the first thing we need to do when introducing a new language target in a lesson? Many common ways of introducing new language targets start with the teachers imposing their realities on the children. This includes clear explanation, clear modeling, and clear demonstration. If we start with the idea that each child is living in their own unique reality, it makes much more sense to start with an activity that draws the children in and enables them to discover our new language target for themselves. For example, we could start with a puzzle that leads the children towards the language target and motivates them to want to learn it. Or we could start with a game and surprise the children with the new language target while they're playing. I will give practical examples of how to do this in my next video, Child-Centered Learning, Example Activities. How about a child who is not paying attention and just staring out the window? Well, in this approach, she is just as much an active learner as the children who are paying attention to the lesson, but has chosen to focus on a different thing. When the class is finished, she may be totally engaged when chatting with her friends. Or she may not be fully engaged until she goes home and sits down in front of her favorite video game. When playing the video game, she may be completely focused, trying things out and getting better and better at the game. She may not even need to pay much attention to any instructions just getting better through trial and error. Why is it that she has chosen to focus so intensely when playing the video game, but chose to stare out the window in our lesson? Why do any of us choose to focus on one thing rather than another thing? Constructivists in general see each of us as natural learners. We are explorers trying to make sense out of the world. And when playing the video game, 
the child was probably in more of a natural learning state than she was in our lesson. I think this means that if we want children to be more engaged in our lessons, we need to bring more of those elements from the video game into our lessons, so that our lessons more closely approximate the natural learning state of children. Let's look more closely at that child playing the video game. She is playing. She is having fun. She is exploring. She feels autonomous. The environment is not threatening. She is making choices. She is probably being constantly challenged to move forward, and in order to play the game well, she needs to expand her understanding of the game to accommodate new information. So, the game contains many of the elements that humanists and constructivists have identified as being important when children learn. What can Kelly add to this? How can his ideas help us in the classroom? How can they help us to keep children engaged and focused on learning? Let's look at some of the most relevant aspects of his theory. At the root of his theory is a long word beginning with A. Can you guess what it is? The first three letters are an insect. What insect begins with A? Can you guess the word? I'm asking these questions so as to build it up. It's a feeling we have before something happens. Maybe you guessed. The word is anticipation. According to Kelly, the direction our minds take and the way our minds move is determined by how we anticipate events. Each of the children in our class is like a scientist, building a theoretical model of how English fits together and using this mental model to test out new things. And it is anticipation that drives this forward. If you take just one thing away from this video that will make an enormous practical difference in your classes, unless you are fully aware of this already, it is to maximize anticipation. If you want children to choose to be focused on your lesson, maximize anticipation. This is a dimension of teaching that teacher-centered methods generally neglect. When a teacher explains clearly, models clearly, demonstrates clearly, or tells the children what they are going to learn before teaching it, or uses many other methods that are common in a teacher-centered classroom. The teacher is not letting the children anticipate enough. If instead, we introduce new language targets through mystery and puzzles, or surprise the children with new language targets when playing a game, the children are much more likely to be engaged and interested in learning. According to Kelly, each of us constructs a mental framework of how we think the world works. We start by learning bits of knowledge and then connect these bits of information together into a framework. We do this by noticing patterns and replications and then use this framework to anticipate and make guesses about new things we encounter. More developed mental frameworks involve more complex networks with connections going all over the place. Even though Kelly was writing 70 years ago, it is amazing how compatible Kelly's ideas are with modern neuroscience. According to Kelly, 
we choose to move in one direction rather than another if we anticipate that a particular direction will extend and define our existing mental framework. It is anticipation that propels us forward. These ideas have many implications in the classroom. It implies that we need to try to understand the world of each of the children and connect the classroom experiences with those worlds as much as possible so that the children feel that what they are learning is relevant to their existing mental framework. We need to draw the children into a lesson by building up their anticipation and then connect language practice with the children's daily lives. Connect the practice with their genuine feelings. Connect new knowledge with prior knowledge. Connect, connect, connect. And Kelly's ideas imply that we need to approach new knowledge from various directions. If we want the children to learn it deeply and build a complex, interconnected mental framework, we can do this by integrating the four skills of listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Or by varying the methods we use, such as by sometimes using music, sometimes flashcards, sometimes logical exercises, and sometimes moving around. Kelly's ideas also imply that children need to feel empowered by what they learn and see a way forward that will enhance both their understanding of English and their general life experience in our classroom. We can achieve this by giving the children many opportunities to anticipate and discover new knowledge in our lessons, instead of receiving information from us. And by having a syllabus with a sense of direction. And by building trust in us. And by building a class environment where children bond together and feel at home. And the children need to feel that what they learn is part of a process that will lead to more and more choices and discoveries in future. Another implication for the English class is that we can be more optimistic about what children can achieve at any particular age than Piaget's stages of learning sometimes seem to suggest. If we can help children construct a complex, interconnected mental model of the English language that they have learned, the children are more likely to reach their full potential. And this leads on to Vygotsky, who focused on another key aspect of how children can reach their full potential. I will just deal with one of Vygotsky's ideas here. The ZPD, the Zone of Proximal Development. The ZPD is especially important for teachers of children to know about because it has had such a big influence on the way children are taught. It is actually amazing how much impact Vygotsky has had even though he died when he was only 37 years old. He thought that higher mental functions develop through cultural interaction and communication with others. He saw children as having the potential to develop beyond what might be considered normal for a particular age if they have the right kind of social interaction. He argued that, at any point in time, a child can reach a certain developmental level independently. But there is a zone beyond this level that the child has the potential to reach. The key factor for a child to reach into this zone, and so reach her full potential, is interaction with a more knowledgeable person. This person can be an adult or another child. In most English classes, it is usually the teacher.
Scaffolding The quality of interaction with the more knowledgeable person is important. In the classroom, the technique teachers use for interacting with children in a way that helps them reach their full potential is called scaffolding. The term scaffolding was not introduced by Vygotsky, but it is the term widely used when applying his ideas in the classroom. Unfortunately, the constructivist concept of scaffolding is often misinterpreted to justify teacher-centered, step-by-step approaches, where the teacher introduces each step through techniques such as clear demonstration, modeling, or explanation. I think this is missing the point. When scaffolding the children's learning, the teacher may well have a good idea of the steps that need to be achieved. But it is not the teacher who is actively doing the building. The children are constructing the building, and the teacher is interacting with the children and providing the scaffolding that enables the children to notice and discover each step for themselves. The children don't learn by following the teacher. They learn by exploring, testing things out, and discovery. The teacher puts as many new challenges in their path as possible so that they are moving forward as fast as possible and reaching their full potential. But each child needs to feel she is overcoming these challenges by thinking things through and working things out. To scaffold effectively, the teacher needs to know the child's current level and know as much about the child's world as possible, and help a child build from there in steps. Just like having scaffolding for each of the floors of a building. The teacher also needs to make sure the children encounter new language targets of an achievable level, and may need to guide or give hints, but then withdraw so that the children can use the language targets by themselves. This is like removing the scaffolding from a building. Thank you very much for watching. In the four videos in this series on psychology in the classroom, I introduced some alternative ideas about how children learn. All my other videos on teaching English to children will be underpinned by the constructivist, child-centered approach.